Welcome to the Nutrition Facts Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Greger. The coronavirus pandemic has made many of us very aware of the importance of maintaining and improving our health. Make that your silver lining, because the more positive change we can make to our diet and lifestyle, the better. Today, we begin a four-part series on strokes. Here's a fun fact. Did you know that more than 90% of stroke risk is attributable to modifiable risk factors? Strokes are one of the leading causes of death and disability in the world, the most common cause of seizures in the elderly, and the second most common cause of dementia, and a frequent cause of major depression. In short, stroke is a burdensome but preventable brain disorder. According to the Global Burden of Disease Study, the largest study of risk factors for human disease in history, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, more than 90% of the stroke burden is attributable to modifiable risk factors, um, though some are easier to modify than others. Uh, for example, about 10% of all healthy years of life lost due to stroke may be due to ambient air pollution. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, technically, that's a modifiable risk factor. You could just move you know, out of the city to some place with cleaner air, but perhaps easier to just quit smoking, which accounts for 18% of the stroke death and disability, about as much as diets high in sodium. Diets high in salt are as bad as smoking when it comes to stroke burden, but not as bad as inadequate fruit and vegetable consumption. Yes, there's you know, also other things like you know, sedentary lifestyles, which is not as bad as not eating enough whole grains, but of the 89% of the stroke, death, and disability that's attributable to modifiable risk factors, fully half appears to be due just to not eating enough fruits and veggies. Fruit and vegetable consumption is associated with a lower risk of about a dozen different diseases, and stroke is way up there. Right? Uh, there appears to be a linear dose-response relationship, a straight-line relationship between more fruits and vegetables and lower stroke risk, suggesting that the, uh, the risk of stroke decreases by 32% for every 200 gram increase in fruits. So that's just like one apple a day, and 11% lower risk for each equivalent amount of vegetables. Particularly potent citrus fruits, apples and pears, and dark green leafy vegetables, one of which you can drink the green leaves of green tea. Right? Drinking three cups of green tea a day is associated with an 18% lower stroke risk. But association doesn't necessarily mean causation. Have there ever been any vegetables put to the test in randomized controlled trials? Yes! Garlic is so potent you can stuff garlic powder into a capsule or compress it into a tablet, so you can put it head-to-head -head against a sugar pill, and garlic beat out placebo for the prevention of CIMT progression, meaning that the thickening of the major artery walls to the neck going up to the brain, a key predictor of stroke risk. Continuing to worsen in the placebo group, but not the garlic group that had been taken just a quarter teaspoon of garlic powder a day. That would cost about uh, no, a penny a day and just make your food yummier anyway. OK, but has there ever been an interventional trial that's actually followed people out to prove that a certain food reduced strokes? Yes, nuts. The PrettyMed study showed that an ounce a day of nuts, which is what I recommend in my daily dozen, cut stroke risk nearly in half. But wait. PrettyMed? Wait a second. Wasn't that the study that was retracted? Um, the PrettyMed trial is one of the most influential randomized trials ever. Yet in 2018, it was retracted only to be later republished after making the necessary corrections due to irregularities in their randomization procedures. The original paper was withdrawn, but in their reanalysis, they found the same results. The same 46% fall in stroke risk in the added nuts group, uh, dropping the 10-year risk of stroke from about 6% down to 3%. The good news is that stroke risk can be reduced substantially by an active lifestyle, succession of smoking, and a healthy diet. All we have to do now is educate and convince people on the benefits that can be expected from healthy lifestyle and nutrition. In our next story, we look at the relationship between stroke risk and dairy, eggs, meat, and soda. 
The large majority of the available evidence is in favor of a protective association between fruit and vegetable consumption and the risk of stroke. Uh, the worst foods appear to be meat and soda. Eating like a, a burger for lunch and a pork chop for dinner, two breakfast sausage lengths, and a typical 20-ounce bottle of soda may increase stroke risk by 60%. Reviewers suggest the meat effect may be the mm, saturated fat or cholesterol, the iron-mediated oxidized fat or the salt, but it could also be the TMAO, the carnitine in meat, and the choline in dairy, seafood, and especially eggs is converted by our gut bacteria into trimethylamine, which is oxidized by our liver to TMAO, which may then contribute to heart attacks, stroke, and death. And indeed, in a 2019 study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association following tens of thousands of Americans for a median of about 17 years, up to a maximum of 31 years, found that higher consumption of dietary cholesterol or eggs was significantly associated with higher risk of incident cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality in a dose-response manner, meaning those who ate more eggs or consumed more cholesterol in general appeared to live significantly shorter lives on average, and the more eggs, the worse it was. And this includes egg consumption and stroke. Uh, but that's not a, what a meta-analysis funded by the egg industry found. It turns out that such meta-analyses have evidently been flawed by major methodological drawbacks. So, to eat or not to eat, it would seem moderation of egg consumption is called for, along with other sources of dietary cholesterol, given the new study data, which had the advantage of a longer follow-up than the majority of the previous studies, and may therefore have you know, provided more power to detect associations. Similarly, with meta-analyses of dairy, no apparent link emerged, but evidence of publication bias was found, meaning there uh, appeared to be missing studies potentially shelved by industry-funded researchers for not showing you know, funder-friendly effects. Researchers studying the relationship between funding sources and conclusions in studies of sugary drinks and milk found the studies funded by the likes of Coca-Cola and the Dairy Council had over seven times the likelihood of coming to funder-friendly conclusions than independent research, which is twice as bad as drug companies. Big Pharma only seems to be able to get away with a threefold bias. Of particular interest, not a single one of the interventional studies looking at soda or milk ended up with an unfavorable conclusion. The bottom line is that, yes, you know, dairy fat may be better than other animal fats, such as those found in meat, uh, but something like whole grains would be better still, though swapping dairy out for refined grains or added sugar wouldn't be doing you many favors. When it comes to stroke risk, vegetable fat is better than dairy fat, meat fat is the worst, whole grains are better, and fish fat, added sugars and refined grains are statistically about the same. In terms of dietary patterns in stroke, most of the studies on plant-based dietary patterns have found a protective effect against stroke, whereas those looking at westernized patterns, those based more on animal foods and added sugars and fats, found a detrimental effect of the adherence to westernized patterns. African Americans are five times as likely to die from stroke in middle age, a black-white disparity largely driven by the fact that they're just having so many more strokes. In this population, a southern-style diet characterized by a lot of fried foods and meat may be playing a role in increasing the risk of stroke, whereas adherence to more plant-based diets may reduce stroke risk. Yes, wrote the director of the Stroke Prevention and Atherosclerosis Research Center, uh, learning to make vegetarian meals every other day is a tall order for most North Americans, but is feasible given tasty recipes and a positive attitude. In our final story today, we hear about one of the first studies on the incidence of stroke in vegetarians and vegans. When ranked in order of importance, among the interventions available to prevent stroke, the three most important are probably diet, smoking cessation, and blood pressure control. Uh, most of us are doing pretty good on smoking these days. Less than half of us are exercising enough, but according to the American Heart Association, only one in a 
1,000 Americans are eating a healthy diet, and fewer than 1 in 10 are even eating a moderately healthy diet. Why does it matter? Because diet is an important part of stroke prevention. Reducing sodium intake, avoiding egg yolks, limiting the intake of meat, and increasing the intake of whole grains, fruits, vegetables, and lentils. Like the sugar industry, the meat and egg industry spend hundreds of millions of dollars on propaganda, unfortunately with great success. I was excited to check out box number one, and was then honored when I did. The strongest evidence for stroke protection is for increasing fruit and vegetable intake with more uncertainty regarding the role of whole grains, animal products, and dietary patterns such as vegetarian diets. I mean, one would expect they'd do great. I mean, Meta-analyses have found that vegetarian diets lower cholesterol and blood pressure and enhance weight loss and blood sugar control, and vegan diets may work even better. So all the key biomarkers are going in the right direction, but you may be surprised to learn that there hadn't ever been any studies on the incidence of stroke in vegetarians and vegans until now. And if you think that's surprising, wait until you hear the results. The risks of heart disease and stroke in meat eaters, fish eaters, and vegetarians over 18 years of follow-up. Yes, less heart disease among vegetarians, by which they mean vegetarians and vegans combined, no surprise, been there, done that, but more stroke. An understandable knee-jerk reaction might be, wait a second, who did this study? But this is Epic Oxford, world-class researchers whose conflicts of interest may be more likely to read, I was a member of the Vegan Society. Uh, what about over-adjustment? I mean, if you crunch the numbers, over a 10-year period they found 15 strokes for every 1,000 meat-eaters, compared to only 9 strokes for every 1,000 vegetarians and vegans. Wait, so how can they say there was more strokes in the vegetarians? This was after adjusting for a variety of factors. For example, the vegetarians were less likely to smoke, uh, so you want to cancel that out by adjusting for smoking so that you can effectively compare the stroke risk of non-smoking vegetarians to non-smoking meat eaters. Right? If you want to know how a vegetarian diet itself affects stroke rates, you want to cancel out these non-diet related factors. Uh, sometimes though you can over-adjust. The sugar industry does it all the time. This is how it works. Imagine you just got a grant from the soda industry to study the effects of soda on the childhood obesity epidemic. I mean, what could you possibly do after you know, putting all the studies together to arrive at the conclusion that there was near zero effect of sugary beverage consumption on body weight? Well, since you know that drinking liquid candy can lead to excess calories that can lead to obesity, if you control for calories, if you control for a factor that's in the causal chain, effectively only comparing soda drinkers who take in the same number of calories as non-soda drinkers, right? Uh, then you could undermine the soda to obesity effect. And that's exactly what they did. That introduces over-adjustment bias. Right? Instead of just controlling for some unrelated factor, you control for an intermediate variable on the cause and effect pathway between exposure and outcome. Right? Over-adjustment is how meat and dairy industry-funded researchers have been accused of obscuring the true association between saturated fat and cardiovascular disease. Right? We know that saturated fat increases cholesterol, which increases heart disease risk. Therefore, if you control for cholesterol, effectively only comparing saturated fat eaters with the same cholesterol levels as non-saturated fat eaters, you, you see how you can undermine the saturated fat to heart disease effect. Right? Since vegetarian eating lowers blood pressure, and a lowered blood pressure leads to less stroke, controlling for blood pressure would be in over-adjustment, effectively only comparing vegetarians to meat eaters with the same low blood pressure. Right? That's not fair, right? since that's one of the benefits of vegetarian eating, not some unrelated factor like smoking, and so it would, be, uh, it would undermine the afforded protection. So did they do that? No. They only adjusted for unrelated factors like education, and socioeconomic class, and smoking, and exercise, and alcohol, right? And that's what you want, right? You want to tease out the effects of a vegetarian diet on stroke risk, right? You, you want to try to equalize everything else to tease out the effects of just the dietary choice.
And since, for example, meat eaters in the study were on average 10 years older than the vegetarians, you can totally see how uh, when you adjust for that, vegetarians could come out worse. Uh, since stroke risk can increase exponentially with age, you can see how having you know, nine strokes among 1,000 vegetarians in their 40s could be worse than 15 strokes among 1,000 meat eaters in their 50s. The fact that vegetarians had greater stroke risk, uh, despite their lower blood pressure, suggests there's, there's something about meat-free diets that so increases stroke risk, it's enough to cancel out the blood pressure benefits. But even if that's true, you still would want to eat that way. I mean, stroke is our fifth leading cause of death, whereas heart disease is number one. So um, yes, in this study, there, there were this many more cases of stroke in vegetarians, but there were this many fewer cases of heart disease. Uh, but if there is something increasing stroke risk in vegetarians, I mean, it'd be nice to know what it is, in hopes of figuring out how to get the best of both worlds. This is the question we'll turn to next. We would love it if you could share with us your stories about reinventing your health through evidence-based nutrition. Go to nutritionfacts.org slash testimonials. We may share it on our social media to help inspire others. To see any graphs, charts, graphics, images, or studies mentioned here, please go to the Nutrition Facts podcast landing page. There you'll find all the detailed information you need, plus links to all the sources we cite for each of these topics. For a vital, timely text on the pathogens that cause pandemics, you can order the ebook, audiobook, or now hard copy of my latest book, How to Survive a Pandemic. For recipes, pre order my How Not to Diet cookbook out this December. It's beautifully designed with more than 100 recipes for delicious and nutritious meals. And all proceeds I receive from the sales of my books go to charity. NutritionFacts.org is a nonprofit science-based public service where you can sign up for free daily updates on the latest in nutrition research via bite-sized videos and articles. Everything on the website is free. There's no ads, no corporate sponsorship. It's strictly non-commercial, not selling anything. I just put it up as a public service, as a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandmother, whose own life was saved with evidence-based nutrition.